Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So as you know, we are having a very interesting and exciting session today. Um, the One Million Voices Initiative presentation uh, about introducing citizen science for agroecology. I'll just do a very brief introduction to the session and then hand over immediately. So we're having this event today and um, presenting is Rosie, who is the managing director of the Citizen Science Center in Zurich. The outline was also included in your invite. We'll have an introduction to general terms as well as values, principles and benefits of citizen science. Then we will look into a few interesting examples um, and then go to thoughts and options for how we can make citizen science work for agroecology. In that context, I had already shared some of the results and some of the process of what we had discussed previously in, with the regional teams and also some other people who are related to the project. Um, and I hope she will be able to, to base her recommendations and thoughts on that. And then um, at, towards the end of her presentation, which should last about 30 minutes, we will have a moderated interactive segment where we can ask questions and get more insights. I think I skipped the recap on the project because we are all familiar with it. We do not have external people. Um, and I will hand straight over to Rosie from here. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I will start sharing my screen. Um, here you go, you should be seeing this. Um, hello, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to introduce to you one of my passions, definitely citizen science, um, that I am now doing as the managing director of the Citizen Science Center in Zurich, which is an initiative of the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. And I will tell you a little bit more about the center at the end of this presentation. So citizen science, I know you have heard the concept because I actually looked at some of the video and the documentation from the past, but let me just remind you mainly a few concepts just to have uh, to agree somehow on a common language when, especially when we talk about the projects on what we are talking about. And uh, citizen science has been around uh, since um, uh, a lot of time. I mean, there are projects actually that are going on uh, since uh, 1900, you know, about birds, uh, even though the term itself was coined only uh, in 1979. Anyway, is uh, the scientific work which is undertaken by the members of the general public together with academic scientists. Um, actually, this is the definition of the Oxford Dictionary, uh, but you do find um, a lot of other definition uh, around, you know, if you if you like Google citizen science, uh, for instance, another one, and, and they are slightly different. Um, often they are very typical of a particular scientific domain or of a particular, you know, area. I really like this one, which is in a Swiss, uh, you know. Um, governmental document that is, uh, is a broad range of activities where people produce scientific knowledge outside of traditional scientific institutions. And I think that this definition re reflect a little bit more the fact that it's hard to define citizen science because it really covers a lot, a lot of practices. All of these definitions though have uh, a few uh, characteristic in common. First of all, uh, you always have in citizen science project public participation, uh, which means people that decide to join this kind of project on a voluntary base, and they are not uh, academic scientists in the particular field of the citizen science project. Um, another thing is voluntary contribution. Um, it's very rare for citizen science project uh, to involve money, to involve payment, uh, even though it happens, especially in developing countries. Most of the time we are talking about voluntary contribution. And the third one is uh, that these projects produce science. So it's not science education or outreach, even though science education is, is part of citizen science, but the idea is really to produce knowledge, new knowledge, science-based. Uh, sorry. Um, so 
when we talk about citizen science project, one of the first thing that you may wonder about is, uh, we are talking about citizens and scientists collaborating, but how much do they actually collaborate? And this really depends from the kind of projects. You have a little bit of everything. The vast majority I have to admit is projects which are a little bit top down, which means that scientists are the one that, you know, do all of the work in terms of finding the research question, designing the protocol, designing you know, what you want to ask to people. And then you basically ask, ask people to contribute. Um, so you know, the collaboration is, is, is a little bit one way. Um, then there are the collaborative projects where the collaboration between the two community is a little bit uh, um, deeper. Uh, you know, citizens may participate on some of the analysis, some of them may join the publication, they can help dissemination. So let's say there is a little bit more of interaction. And then there is the third kind, uh, which is the kind that we really promote in Zurich. This is the kind of citizen science that actually everybody is kind of dreaming to do, even though it's not that this obvious is when the two communities, uh, so the scientific community and, and, and the so-called citizens or participants do collaborate from the very beginning, from thinking about the problem, deciding how you wanna solve it, designing the protocol, this, designing the experiment, doing the analysis, doing the publication. So co-creation is somehow, you know, what we are all aiming at, even though um, I have to say that citizens are happy to participate and they do participate in all of these projects. You know, even the contributory one, which is, I said, you know, top down, um, most of the people don't really care. I mean, most of the people really enjoy contributing to these projects in any way. Another way to look at these projects uh, um, is uh, not so much, you know, how, how much and how the two communities are, are really working together, but it's mainly the way you are involving the crowd. So how, what are you asking people to do? How are you asking them to collaborate? And again, you have a little bit of everything, honestly. Um, and I think that what I'm doing here is really an oversimplification and, and sorry about doing that. Uh, but uh, because the reality is way more complicated, but let's say for, for the sake of this presentation of this short introduction, there are two main group of projects. There are the projects where you are asking people to collect the data for you. And this can be data in terms of like images, you know, geolocated picture, um, description, you know, surveys, uh, uh, can also be samples, you know, samples of water, samples of air. But basically the role of the citizens is the one to, to be your sensor, is also called uh, volunteer sensing. They, they are the sensor for you and they collect data. So I will give you a few examples and, and uh, I have a lot of examples. So I will go uh, very quickly through them and, and hopefully later on you will have questions, uh, you know, if you want to know more details and you will add the slides as well, you can always go back and check out these projects in more detail. So iNaturalist, um, this is a very, very famous platform uh, and citizen science traditionally is very, very strong in, uh, in biodiversity, in everything that has to do with nature. People love taking pictures of insects, of animals, of plants. Uh, so iNaturalist is a database where you can, you know, contribute uh, out of your smartphone, uh, these kind of, of pictures. And um, just very quickly have a look at the numbers here. This is a very well-known platform that really contributes data to, for scientific publications and to scientific database. We are talking about more than 3 million people that are contributing to this platform, you know, 50 million different observation and, and working with, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of of different species. 
this is another thing that people love again animals somehow related but is more some kind of uh, you know um, ecosystem services if you want uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, projects about bees uh, this is just an example of them and this is just um, people contributing photos you see the the explanation in the in the right in the left sorry uh, bottom corner of, of the page you just take a picture you upload it geolocated and you are mapping you know bumblebees uh, in this case uh, all over the states uh, and also monitoring uh, the decline of the population Another kind of projects always based on, on smartphone. And, and I have to say that the vast majority is nowadays of this kind of data contribution comes from, from smartphone contribution. This is NASA that organized this. Uh, and this is basically many different things that you can do to understand the microclimatic variation. So you can contribute images of clouds. Uh, you can contribute, you know, presence of trees, evolution of trees along the seasons. Um, there is a part on land cover. And actually, a lot of uh, these kind of projects uh, um, are actually a lot. I would say um, increasingly, let's say, um, considering you know, how much we use uh, information from satellites, how much we use images from satellites in, 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 uh, you know, in monitoring and studying a lot of aspects of nature. Um, a lot of citizen science projects do what is called the ground truthing, which means uh, basically verifying that what you are looking at from your satellite images has been identified uh, you know, in the correct way. Um, and again, a lot about weather, uh, a lot about, you know, temperature and precipitations also because again, it is uh, increasingly easier to collect uh, this kind of information with your smartphone. Um, this is a, a project about water, fresh water watch. Um, Again, uh, look at the numbers. They are is more than eight thousand participants, and they are monitoring uh, almost three thousand by now water bodies all over the place. This is nice because some aspect of this uh, project involve uh, citizens kind of adopting uh, a certain river or a certain lake, uh, and and really going back regularly every year uh, to provide information about um, about the river. Um, there is a lot of citizen science in, in water resources and hydrology, and I'm just showing this uh, uh, which is a compendium, a little, a little bit of existing, uh, um, you know, projects on the field. What they do most of the time is uh, projects that cover monitoring of precipitation, water quantity and quality in rivers or lakes, soil moisture, level of flood, and risk management. And that you can see, I mean, you can really find uh, uh, them. Uh, um, quite spread all over the globe. Other projects now, they are not based on photos from, uh, from your smartphone, but actually citizens collect samples and they send the samples to researchers. And we have a lot of projects of this kind, both for water, as we just mentioned, but for hair as well. Um, or in this case, uh, um, you know, pests, uh, insects. Uh, uh, this is a pretty famous uh, project where people uh, collect uh, um, specimen of this uh, particular uh, um, pest, which is this uh, cabbage uh, butterfly. And they send them to the researchers that do both uh, um, some kind of mapping of uh, invasion routes, but also they look at the structure of uh, the genetic structure of the pest. Uh, talking about soil, uh, there is this project that has been reproduced uh, in many different places, uh, you know, in, in the States, uh, in, uh, in Australia, and now very recently was launched in Switzerland, in Zurich. Um, it's very simple and, and more than 
providing real detailed scientific evidence is, is somehow more to raise awareness, especially among farmers, of the importance uh, of the quality of soil and the health of soil. And it's simply, you know, people that are wearing uh, underwear, cotton underwear, and then uh, uh, basically digging them up after a certain number of weeks. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, basically you look at the decomposition of your underwear and this is related in a scientific way, actually to the health uh, of the soil. So that's it for the examples about data collection. Now let's move to the second big chunk of projects, uh, which is about data analysis. So in this case, you are not most of the time, you know, working with your smartphone. These are projects that are better done with a web interface, with a big monitor because what you are using is like the brain power of people. It's not citizens and sensor, it's not citizens that go out for you, it's citizens that use their brain power for you. And this kind of project is basically citizens doing tasks which are still quite difficult for computers, even though as we all know, artificial intelligence is like quickly catching up, but there are, you know, many things where humans are still much better than machines, uh, or humans are still very useful in training the machines or teaching to the machines. And this is like image analysis, pattern recognition, transcription, translation of document or mapping. A few examples as well of this kind of projects. This is uh, a project based on camera trap. And this particular one was in our platform in Zurich, but there are a lot of similar projects, especially in Africa, monitoring, uh, you know, bio uh, animals, uh, you know, in, in, in parks, um, especially in Serengeti and in many national parks, actually, in Africa. This one was in Switzerland, and this group uh, of researchers was looking at weasels and the decline of the weasels population in Switzerland. So they placed camera trap a little bit everywhere in Switzerland, and they captured many, many, you know, thousands of these clips. And the question was, what is in the clip? So most of the time was a mouse, as you see in this particular one. But basically, the idea is that you sit in front of the computer, you look at the clip, and then on the right side of the screen, you have this menu of different possibilities, which is very detailed, very well described. And then you basically <clears throat> enter there uh, what you recognize in the video. This is a project of uh, forest monitoring. Uh, it's just one of the many that exist. Uh, what they do is they look at images from satellite and they look at sign of deforestation. Some of them look at signs of illegal deforestation. So basically, again, they go back to the same area over and over to see if the extent of the forest uh, um, changes. This is uh, again camera tracked. This is a project in Kenya. In this case, uh, this, they are looking at this prickly pear, which is a cactus, which is uh, you know, a kind of plant. And they are studying, which has been imported and is not really original, is an invasive plant for what concerns most of, the, of Africa. And um, basically, they are asking people to, to basically look at the, at the different mammals that are captured by, um, by the cameras. Again, if you look at the number, when you do this kind of studies, um, you have a lot of data. Okay, in this case, you know, you see they have almost 600,000 classifications that need to be done. And they are asking, this is a very new project in a, in a platform called Zooniverse, uh, which is uh, basically a lot of um, contributors based in the States. They already have, uh, you know, 3,500 volunteers. They completed 2,000 of them, but, you know, there are many more to go. And this, again, is a very typical um, uh, citizen science uh, project of, of this kind. 
this is, uh, I mean, is, is very hardly uh, connectable with, with agriculture or food, but I think it's, it's just an example to give you the breadth of this kind of project. This is, is linguistic. It's like it's a totally different field. And there are many projects uh, in linguistic. This particular one was studying, uh, you know, old uh, dialect, German dialect, uh, based on handwritten documents. And so the idea was as a citizen, you could either transcribe what was handwritten into a digital format, or you could uh, try to translate uh, the dialogue. And similar project exists uh, for you know, a lot of, let's say document-based project. You can present in PDF and ask people to look at the content, to look at the form, to translate, to transcribe, to really do a lot with these kind of documents. Last example, again, has very little to do with agriculture. However, um, this is just an example of a different way of doing citizen science, uh, which is always you know, based on a computer, but that introduces the concept of gamification. And in this particular case, what you're doing is you are playing with a 3D puzzle. So, you know, a lot of kids do that, a lot of very young people. They have no idea of what they're doing, but they're having a lot of fun. And what they are doing in reality is that they are mapping the 3D structure of neurons. So they're actually helping scientists to understand the human brain. But again, they are playing, and this is something that is very attractive for a lot of people, um, especially if you have a kind of uh, subject or study uh, where, where you can use uh, this approach. So enough with examples. So let's go back a little bit to the theory. Um, so what are the benefits of citizen science? Why? you should uh, you know spend your time into organizing these kind of projects that and you know is is not you know as simple as it may seem and i will touch some of it later uh, so the the benefits for scientists are are obvious you know uh, i mentioned the, the the thing of resources you are comparing the typical research group of a, you know a typical professor or researchers at the university with a, with a few postdocs, a few PhD students. So a limited uh, amount of, of resources versus potentially, and I say potentially because of, it's obviously not the case, but potentially everybody out there contributing to your study. Uh, so if your study needs, uh, you know, data from wide geographical extensions, or if it needs data for a long period of time, the benefits of citizen science are, are obvious. Um, also in terms of dissemination and impact, of course, uh, you, can, uh, you can have way more visibilities uh, where you have uh, this kind of, of approaches. And another aspect uh, which is very important, even though is often underestimated, is that when you interact with the citizens, you really get on board a new perspective. They have a totally different way of looking at the research question and at whatever you are doing in a way that is very different from what you know, a typical scientist would do. So the conversation between the two is, is really interesting and it really brings a lot of richness to the research. In terms of citizens, you know, why should they spend their time, you know, looking at your images or translating your document. Um, there are a lot of studies for that. Uh, there are a lot of publications, a lot of literature. And, um, you know, the, the answers actually of the citizens are, 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 are very, very consistent. The, the big main reason is that people feel, uh, you know, some personal satisfaction in contributing to something bigger than them. You know, they are contributing to science. So they're not wasting their time. They're really, doing something bigger. And so you should actually make sure that this is the case and that you're not you know, wasting their time. But this is another, another question. Uh, then they learn, you know, they learn about the topic of the project, which most of the time is something they're very passionate about because people join projects according to their interests. 
So they learn more, they learn better, they communicate with a, with a scientist. Uh, there is a social dimension, a networking dimension, because these projects are very often, um, they have a part of you know, forums or, or like discussions where people can get in touch with each other. And so people get the chance to get in touch with like-minded people, with people that have uh, the same interest or maybe they share the same concern on a certain issue. And then again, sometimes it's just fun. Some of these projects are very well designed. They, they are fun, they are nice to look at, they're nice that they have this gamification and competition component. So people enjoy doing that. I mentioned here data quality because I'm sure is uh, probably was going to be one of the first question that, that I get. I always get this question and, and this is uh, you know, uh, something that has always been an issue for, for the methodology because uh, it's very easy somehow to, to say, you know, how can you trust uh, data uh, provided by people that have no training, that they have no knowledge uh, versus scientists that have been spent you know, years and years in preparing uh, on a certain topic. And again, there are many studies, it's not me saying that, you can go and check the literature. And all of these studies have shown that actually the quality of the citizen contribution equals the one of professional scientists. However, this happens when the methodology has the same level of accuracy as the traditional man, uh, methods, which means that you should know what you are doing. Citizen science is not something that you can improvise. Uh, that I mean, th th there is a way to do it. There is a way to design your protocol. There are ways and things that you can ask uh, to citizens or not. So. The idea is there is a methodology, and if you follow the methodology, then the quality of the data is, uh, is equal to the one of professional scientists. So I will spend the last just a few minutes about the citizen science in Zurich, uh, because hopefully it can be useful uh, uh, for you as well. Uh, the center has been, research, has been created basically by these two institutions to support both citizens and scientists who wants to start this kind of citizen science project. We are keen about co-creation, if you remember what I said at the beginning. We are keen about um, having projects that produce excellent science, and we are also keen about supporting projects that contribute to sustainable development. Uh, how do we support you? Uh, we work on four different areas. The first one is the methodology. As I said, you know, you should know how to do this project. And most of the time when people have an idea about the citizen science project, they don't know about it. And we are there to help you. We are there to provide, you know, tips and tricks for doing this kind of research. We also have a citizen science academy, participatory science academy, uh, which works at the university level, at the institutional level to provide courses and training to students. And they also provide seed grants to projects. Then we work with tools. We provide some tools open, free, that anybody can use. I will mention two of them in the next slides. Because as you know, if you just look at the examples, you immediately understand that usually you need you know, either a web app or a smartphone app if you want to engage with these kind of projects. Then there is community building. Um, community building is, is a very um, important aspect of this project. There are a lot of people especially I have to say most of the scientists, let's say that reach out to us and, and they think that, you know, people are just out there and, and they have nothing better to do than come and contribute to, to your project. Uh, this is obviously not true. People have a lot of, you know, better things to do and you are competing with platforms like, you know, um, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. So, 
there is a way you have to look for your community. You have to reach out, you have to be proactive. And once you have captured their attention, you have to retain them in your project so that they keep coming back and they keep contributing. So community management is really a, a very big and very important part uh, of this kind of projects. Uh, we have a full-time community manager. Again, we will not do community management for you, but we can help you with the basics. And then the networking part is more for partnership, you know, grant proposals, uh, if you want to work with us, but also um, in the sense that we do work with a wider network of citizen science. You know, you may be aware there are citizen science network, you know, almost everywhere. There is the European citizen science network, the American one, the Australian one, one in Asia and a newborn, the, the one, the citizen science Africa that was just, you know, very recently created. And uh, we work with all of them, uh, you know, have been around for a while. I've been working with, with some of these people. And the idea is um, if you come to us and you need contacts or you need a particular expertise that maybe we don't have, because obviously we, do, we don't know everything far from that. Chances are that we do know somebody that has been working in the field and we are very happy to put you in contact with the right people, with people with experience, with other tools maybe that are different from the one that we provide. And now very quickly our tools, the project builder is for the web based projects. So the idea is uh, you have uh, digital data can be PDF from social media, images, video clips. And in this platform, you can create projects that involve the crowd into the analysis. It's very easy. It's, like, there is a step-by-step -step process. You create your project and you publish it. This is just an example. These were researchers from Milano working with uh, social media with tweets. And uh, basically, you see that the interface of this kind of projects is, is, is very, very consistent, very standard. On the right side, you have uh, the data. In this case, is a tweet with an image. And on the left side is whatever you want to ask people to do. In this case, it's just answering a few questions. And then the other tool that we have is a smartphone app, the Citizen Science Logger. Um, Again, is exactly the same principle. It's open, it's free, anybody can use it. Uh, you can, via a web dashboard, you can create your app. So let's say your app can be a survey, can be collecting images, again, collecting video clip. Uh, you decide this in this web interface with a very simple, again, step-by-step. And then with one click, you have your app deployed both in Android and, and iOS. So very powerful, um, very simple uh, to use. And this is an example. Again, the interface is simple. If you want something super fancy, you can always get to that later on, but especially to pilot your project, to test this project, we really encourage you to use this free and available tool. Um, again, simple, but it can really do everything you need. And that's it, I will stop here um, and open the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Ruthie. This was very interesting and I'm not sure whether you're seeing the chat, but I think people are really enjoying themselves. Uh, a really, no, really I, interesting yeah. presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, some people are clapping for you. Wonderful. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. Questions. Do you want to take a yeah? Do you want to take a brief minute, or can I go ahead immediately and ask my questions before opening to the rest of the participants? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So let me start by going back to my slide that I skipped in the beginning, um, just to to put us all back on on one page. So I I spoke I skipped the brief recap of the project. 
So just to like remind you as well, like what our objective is and what matters to us, and then I will ask questions uh, about your presentation in relation to our project. So the overall goal of our project, as you know, is to develop a tool or a series of tools that enable the farmers, producers, or produce organizations, consumers, or other potential end users to inclusively participate in agroecology movements, to support sustainable adoption of agroecology, and to contribute to the collection, co-creation, sharing of information to fill key knowledge gaps on the performance of agroecology. So as you know, our entire um, initiative, citizen science initiative, is centered on agroecology. And in terms of the process, what we discussed as well is that we have this value-driven participatory co-creation process that we're looking at, which, which um, includes those coordinated but specific regional dialogues in the various regions that we're collaborating with. Um, the worldwide review and analysis of existing approaches to citizen science that support agroecology and agroecological transitions, and then collaboration with relevant knowledge partners such as yourself. Or such as yourself. Um, so I have a few questions and I would like to proceed with them. So the first thing that I had been thinking about as I was listening to you is that I, I, I see the values and I see the various approaches that can be taken to how people are being included once the idea is there. But would you be able to advise us on how we get to having an inclusive idea in the first place so that our, our initiative is, is, is fully inclusive and value driven from the beginning, so that already the design and the idea is, does not duplicate anything that exists already, but also is relevant for a global context, um, for various different contexts, but like globally, um, in the context of agroecology. So that is my first question. The second question that I have is I saw um, that you spoke about that many of the initiatives that exist have historically had a very strong focus on biodiversity and biophysical um, data and biophysical concerns. But agroecology really bridges those two and has a very strong social component, both in the process but also in the data. So I'm, I'm wondering whether you have any kind of advice for how we advice and examples for how we can bridge the two that the process is inclusive, but also that the kind of data that is being collected like response and it corresponds to the social component and then perhaps my last question would be in terms of limitations um in context with limited literacy and also limited technology access because as as you know we are looking at developing something that can be used in various contexts and where interaction and co-creation can exist across different regions where then like the data and the process can like communicate regionally within itself but also across regions so i was wondering about that and in connection to that just also because you're saying like a lot of data points, I assume the data is very big. What do we have to consider in terms of platforms where the data is stored and for how long, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, I'm so sure. I, probably you will have to remind me the questions I, I, I wrote down, but uh, okay, let's start with the first one, the co-creation. So the co-creation project uh, process, as I said, is, is really something that we are, we are really keen about. And we spend a lot of time in doing, you know, before even starting worrying about, you know, which tool or which platform. Um, however, I mean, basically you have to start somewhere, okay? And, and usually, uh, at least what I've seen in my experience, uh, actually in my experience, having some kind of an academic research background is most of the time the scientists they come up uh, and reach out with a question. So they have an issue, they have a particular study, and uh, they would like for many different reasons to involve uh, um, citizens. And at this point, what we recommend uh, it is uh, to immediately try to find out if there is uh, you know, somebody at the level of society, some organization, some, let's say citizens, that they would want to involve into the study just to make sure that the problematic and the whole idea is something that resonates. And for citizens is a little bit the same. We had several NGOs reaching out to us. Um, usually they have an issue, they have a social issue that for us needs somehow to be translated into a research question. So if you have you know, an issue, and again, I just use very simple examples, but you have an issue with the water of your river, you know, somehow you have to go and define, I mean, which issue in particular, we talk about pollution, I would talking. So 
what, what we do is we really put uh, the two communities together as early as possible, and then we accompany them into the conversation that follows. So, and in your particular case, I think it would be exactly the same. Uh, what we try to avoid is, um, is the famous answer looking for a question. So, you know, just decide on a project, decide on, on a methodology, and then looking for places where it could be applied. No, the idea is starting from the community, because if they don't have any issue, which is hard, but it can happen, then you don't need a citizen science project there. So the idea is really that very natural, you know, communities uh, and, 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 and researchers that are there should come up with what is really an issue. And then we see if citizen science can be an answer or not. That is usually the way, uh, the way we work. Um, another question, I mean, you mentioned, and then social, I mean, again, the, the, we have a lot of uh, people that reach out, reach out with the, purely kind of social questions, you know, um, gender violence. We had these uh, ladies we worked with uh, in India. Uh, she wanted to map, uh, you know, um, sexual harassment uh, in Mumbai. And, and she, she just came, uh, basically this was the whole idea. And then <clears throat> actually she did a lot of work. But, um, and then we find out, uh, we, we try to work together how you can, uh, you can track it, how you can map it. And, and actually this project is called Safe City. You can go and watch it, it's, it's really amazing. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of issues are social uh, at the beginning, even water quality is a social issue. So I don't really see a lot of differences between the two, honestly. I mean, you, you can really, um, I think that that especially the moment you involve citizens, an issue becomes a social, uh, you know, unless you are talking about astronomy, which is, you know, the case as well for citizen science projects. But, you know, it's more and more issues that really have an impact on, on society. Concerning limited technology, um, technological skills, and, uh, you know, you you don't have to necessarily use a smartphone, uh, even though we know very well that nowadays, you know, a lot, a lot of people have a, smart, have a smartphone, even in developing countries. They may not have internet connection all the time, but again, this is not an issue. Most of these apps just get stored the data until, you know, you get somewhere and you, and you uh, upload them. Um, you don't need any way a smartphone. Some of these projects, first of all, use just kits, simple kits, can be low cost, uh, can be do it yourself. Uh, you know, we collaborate a lot, especially in my past, uh, I collaborated with makerspaces and Fab Lab all over the place. They can build the kit on their own when you are talking about, you know, sampling water or sampling air. But also, I would like to mention um, UCL, uh, UCL University College in London. Um, they developed an app uh, which is for non-literate people, people that cannot write or read, is all based on images. Uh, and, and again, it just the result is the same. People collect images geolocated, even though you know, they have never used an app before. Um, it is true that most of the time, um, I'm thinking about a project that I work with in Tanzania. They wanted to map um, water points, uh, you know, water sources in, in the different villages. And, and so they got a big donation by, by a foundation and they donated the smartphone to the schools uh, and then the kids uh, did the mapping. So you have, you know, several ways you can try to cure the lack of technology or, or lack of, you know, availability of, of technological tools. I don't know if I'm answering to your question, feel free to interrupt and- uh, oh, Absolutely, absolutely. Perhaps just also on the data storage platforms. So data storage, uh, it really depends. In our case, uh, we store our data in our service at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Um, we have uh, a lot, I mean, we, we respond to all of the, the privacy, or, you know, the European GDPR plus the Swiss rules and regulations. 
So we store very little personal information. If the project has to do with personal health information, uh, we do require the blessing of the ethical committee of your institution before, before we implement the project. And, and at the moment, we have been storing data in our servers and, and we never had any particular issue. However, again, depending on, on the storage and depending on where you want to store your data, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really not a mandate. You can, as long as you are very careful about this legal and ethical aspect, you, you can store them anywhere. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sure that many others have questions, so please just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, uh, uh, Fergus here. Um, I, I'm just wanting to try to get things very practical. <clears throat> so if we take one of the elements of the objectives that we have, it is to assess the performance of agroecology approaches or, or practices uh, across a uh, broad range of, of context to understand, you know, what's motivating to do uh, people to do things in different places and uh, whether or not um, what the outcomes of, of doing diff taking different courses of action. So if we just take that as a context then immediately the, the issue of the relationship between the scientist and the uh, citizen, in, in this case, the participants will be farmers of one type or another or farm workers, people you know, who are involved in agriculture or other parts of the food system. Um, and they, they are doing things. And, but, but we are interested as much in their evaluation criteria as in any predetermined scientific understanding that we have of um, performance measures. So we want to have something which is inclusive in terms of the measurement, as well as in terms, you know, what should be measured is as contextually um, uh, variable as uh, the measurements themselves. And of course, there will be both ecological, um, uh, biophysical, if you like, and social dimensions to uh, those performance measures. Even if we take something simple like a, an integrated pest management practice, you know, why it's adopted, what impacts it has on people will be a mixture of these things. So even if we take, you know, what, what appears to be a relatively simple starting point like that, if we wanted to organize something across you know, many different contexts, where of course there'll be different practices that are relevant, um, how feasible is that? Um, uh, 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 and, and how would we ensure that it was networked so that people are learning from the experiences that other people have, even if not all of the knowledge is transferable? because uh, what works where and for whom does have that contextual specificity. So uh, being able to understand what's context specific and what's generalizable becomes you know, a key issue. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, it's, uh, let's say, if I think about, the, the example that you mentioned, so pest management, okay. Um, basically, what, what, I, what I was trying to express, if you want, in, in like talking about this collaboration between the citizens and the scientists that has to start as early as possible. In this case, it would basically translate into this kind of question. So you want to monitor, you know, pests, presence or, or evolution or whatever. So what exactly, what aspect of pest management exactly? You would, and then you would have the opinion of the scientists and the scientists would say, well, I mean, to actually learn something that can be then used at the level of you know, policy or anything, we need to monitor 
these, these, and these aspect. Okay, this would be like the typical approach of a scientist and may be valid across the globe or again can be like location dependent, but usually scientists, not usually, they have to have clear somehow what they would need in order to make use of the data provided. And then you look at it from the point of view of the farms, okay, and of the farmers, sorry. And the farmers would be sitting at the table and listening to this and saying, well, first of all, discussing, you know, if, if this can be done or not, but then also discussing what is in there for them, you know, why should they provide this? They should first of all understand what the scientists would do with that data and how the data that they provide would be useful to them and to other on the longer term. And then they can also tell you what they are available to collect or not, because the scientist uh, or the policymaker or whoever may want you know, a certain information for a certain amount of time, and the farmers can tell you, well, no, you know, um, I cannot, or it's too long, or I'm not available, or so is all of this mediation in order to find a situation where what you are doing is clear for everybody, everybody has a stake, everybody has a clear, you know, interest and a clear benefit in the participation, and only at the point you start talking about the tools, and which at that point are the, the list of your problems. Because again, a lot of tools exist which are free and available. And especially again, to pilot projects, really you, you don't have to do anything um, particularly you know, expensive. I don't know if this answer your question, but this is a, a little bit, you know, the way you go about starting this kind of projects is a conversation that has to start somewhere though. So again, it, it can be an NGO that comes to you and, and they say, you know, we want to monitor, we want to have more information about this certain pest. And then, you know, probably there is a reason for that, that the farmers have a reason, but that the scientists need to understand it and need to agree with that. And for us, it's very important this collaboration because is somehow, one of the few things that guarantee that at the end of the story, the, the data that you have are quality data and can be used for the scientific publication if you are you know, a researcher or a professor. But if you are an NGO or if you are you know, a, a village or a group of farmers, you want that data to be used for policy making, you know, to change things. And, and so the quality is essential for, for everybody involved. Fergus, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, that, that's super, thanks. I think Esther, yeah. Yes, thank you, Lisa. And thank you, uh, Miss Rosie, for this very interesting and inspiring presentation. I really love uh, knowing more about a citizen science, actually, when I first heard the term in our meetings with the PPP on AE. I was kind of attracted to the to, to the concept no? because as a farmers association, we are a farmers association in in Asia. Um, we have always uh, advocated for farmers as also scientists, no, with their own and 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 with their own knowledge and wisdom that should be respected and considered and incorporated in the mainstream or professional quote unquote science now. And from your presentation, I really I got two two main points no in in conduct in in on on citizen science. One is we we need to be very clear no what is the research question after all science starts with a question or a hypothesis right and and the second thing is uh, the second thing i learned from your presentation is that if we want to have uh, many citizens to contribute 
we should tell them or they should feel the benefit of the of their participation so that's that's my second learning that which i get from your presentation and i'm also glad to know that this can be applied uh, in in analyzing uh, social issues and in making policy recommendations now because what we want in this million voices uh, initiative is agroecology and agroecology is not your kind of like bird watching or something like that but it's really a very comprehensive uh term comprehensive term for a kind of a system of, of agriculture that we want to mainstream or we want okay so so these three things and so uh, it's not a question but i would like to uh, start this brainstorming process and maybe hear from you because when we heard this million voices initiative the first thing that we that we thought was oh our farmers you know we have we always we say that we have 10 million farmers as members no? and maybe we could just get a million of them or even just 10,000 of them to i to to tell us if they are practicing for example agroecology and what kind of agroecology they practice what kind of system what what are their challenges now what are their needs now, and when we get this data we will be able to uh, be more uh, know what what kind of uh, issues and problems and challenges to address and therefore our policy recommendations can can be adapted to to what the farmers say but i really don't know how will it be feasible because the the examples that you showed us is really very concrete like how many birds what kind of animals you see in the cliff but agroecology is encompassing so should we for example have like uh if, if this is a 10 year 10 year project for example on agroecology citizen science then we uh, for for one year we narrow we narrow agroecology into one aspect and get data from the citizens about it uh, I, I i would want the co-creation part no the co-creation part with the scientists and the farmers who are inside the tpp ae because that's the composition very glad that that's the composition also of tpp ae so in terms of really doing this uh should we focus first on one research narrow the agroecology into specific research questions and do the citizen science per per question something like that or can we do a, a more comprehensive one so what do you think how should we start well, I mean, that is that is a, a difficult question and is certainly not for me. Uh, I can give you my, uh, you know, immediate reaction, which is based on, on the little that I learned reading a little bit about agroecology in these days. And as you said, is, is a concept that encompasses a lot of aspect, right? So if I put myself in the shoes of a farmer somewhere, and you come to me with, uh, you know, with a survey or with something that asks me, you know, do you do agroecology and, and what do you need? You know, I don't know how many, I mean, I didn't know honestly what agroecology was until a few months ago. Uh, and probably farmers do, but probably they don't. Uh, so I don't know, you know, how effective and how useful uh, something as generic as, you know, are you doing agroecology and, you know, what do you need? I don't know how effective that could be. Uh, personally, I always like to start small and very concrete. So your, your approach that you just said, uh, maybe use one year to focus on agroecology on a particular application, on a particular field. And gay can be, you know, I don't know, water management, can be pests, can be whatever, just pick a topic. 
And then on that specific topic, I imagine that you can formulate your questions, which are always the same question, you know, trying to understand if farmers do agroecology or not, or what they need. But you can formulate the question in a way that I do believe farmers will understand much better because it is exactly what they do. And even without knowing the concept, they will be able to answer to your question. So, you know, me, I would say, yeah, I would advise you start, you know, trying to focus a little bit more and then maybe with time you open up. But, you know, it's just my personal opinion. So, uh, I mean, all of you are way more expert than I am, uh, you know, on what the farmers know or don't know about agroecology. But, you know, another thing is concerning the tools. Yeah, if you want to go with a survey, uh, you know, that would be very easy. There are a, there are a lot of, of ways of doing that. Uh, um, so, I, again, uh, technology is, is never really an issue in this kind of projects. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being picked up from the office here. Um, <laughs> just also to be mindful of time, would we perhaps have one more question? And then I would um, encourage all the participants to continue thinking about it. So we'll share, obviously, we'll share the recording and the presentations. And this is an ongoing process, a conversation, as we all know. So if we have more questions, please put them down in writing, share them with us. Um, but if anyone would have one last question, question perhaps? No, I guess you can go, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> can, right. can, can I just say one thing? I, I, I think just putting together that last interaction between uh, Esther and uh, Rosie, I, I think, you know, having a, a survey um, with, um, you know, key, clear questions in it, but that goes to a very large number um, of farmers who are members of um, AFSA, AFA, and so on, uh, so that you get back some basic feedback on um, uh, uh, important questions, um, uh, which allows you to then decide which areas to focus on would be a double win because you'd be getting immediately a large number of voices giving you some feedback, which is also usable uh, uh, for policy purposes and all sorts of things, because it's giving you an idea of large numbers of farmers who've got particular um, uh, interest or, uh, or or issues. Obviously, the design of that survey would be would need to be very well done, and it would need to be potentially, you know, different in Africa than Asia and so on. <clears throat> but nevertheless, if it's well designed, that could produce a huge immediate um, um, uh, payoff in terms of having something. Uh, um, about the the the, the scope uh, in, in a big way, and allow you to then focus um, more detailed studies around some of the key priorities. So that that does sound like quite an exciting way forward that people might want to think about. <coughs> and I would and I would add to that, Ferguson, that that survey needs to be co-designed with the people. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you for emphasizing that, uh, Miss Rosie, because for us, we would uh, really want a co-creation of any citizen science project on agroecology. We have many research questions. We have research questions at the farmer level, for example, how do you do? How do you do agroecology when this pest attacks you? What, what you can do? How do you, what, what are the tools out there? What are the technologies out there that farmers are already using? So we, if we could have that, no? if we could have that. And then what, what, uh, what policies are there already that, that uh, uh, farmers find beneficial so that others who don't have that policy can, can then uh, try to tweak it to their own local and political context. So things, uh, things like this, or how, how much is your government supporting you to do, to do 
uh, sustainable agriculture to uh, to do climate resilient agriculture so that it can help us at do advocacy work for the government budget that we will need to to mainstream sustainable agriculture so things like this so so many many questions uh, that we want to know no uh, uh, for from from our members so that we could make very intelligent uh, analysis and then policy recommendations and help them with the tools and the technologies because they want to know how to do when the pest attack when there is drought and you can, you don't want to you don't want to uh, apply chemical fertilizer what to do yeah i'm i'm thinking um since we are eight minutes over, let's let's end it here. Okay. But I'm sending an email with the recording, with the presentations, and then also with a way forward. So we continue meeting with the regional leads. And I will definitely make sure to stay in, in interaction with Rosie and bring her back in whenever it makes sense for us. And then we can discuss those questions in more detail. So it's very important what you raise. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to say a last word or we close it here? Okay, I think we can close. Thank you very much, Rosie. That was You're fantastic. welcome. Very Thank interesting. you. Looking Thank forward you to collaborating yes. with you. Bye. As well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.